Well, good afternoon, everybody. I was waiting for someone to get it to st get things started, and then I'd realized it was me that needed to get things started. So, well, I appreciate you coming out this afternoon and having a um, conversation about our campus. So we've got our leadership team, and uh, look forward to a, a a good afternoon. Make sure I get this right, Kayla. So, so our agenda uh, for today, we're. I, I'm going to take part of it, and then we're going to turn it over to some of the leadership teammates to talk about other, other parts of it. But legislative update, Board of Regents update, uh, Vice President Corman's going to talk about the budget. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the efficiencies we've been uh, achieving. Um, Michaela Willis is going to talk about proactive enrollment and some uh, marketing campaign things that, sh that you might not have seen since you're not... Uh, 18 to 22, and, uh, and then uh, we're going to kind of tag team a summer construction and uh, project discussion about what's going on, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, so th on, the legis on the legislative and Board of Regents updates, um, I, I don't know that... Uh, I had much to do with this, but I work awful hard at uh, taking our number one priority, which is salary policy, uh, every year to every meeting I go to uh, with policymakers. And so we were successful, and uh, uh, the, I think fortunate that the governor gave us a two and a half percent salary policy to work with. And they also the the state of South Dakota also picked up an awful lot of the health insurance cost increase that, that, that the system is going to face. So uh, there was good news, from, certainly from the legislature, that we had 2.5% salary policy, which it wish had been for, but um, gave us something to work with to uh, reward you for all that you do. Uh, the the uh, guns on campus bill, oh, uh, lots of help from uh, the student association working with with a lot of us on that. I probably spent um, more time on that issue than any other issue that I worked on during the session. Um, I identified 25 senators that I interacted with uh, with on a very, very regular basis uh, that we had to get it killed in, so to speak, in the Senate uh, or, or it, it had an awful good chance of passing. So it did, uh, it was um, not uh, didn't make it out of committee and uh, was they tried to resurrect it on the floor, but uh, we were successful and a lot of people were successful in, in stopping that. That was particular concern because there are 10 states that do allow guns on campus and um, the tragedy yesterday at North Carolina State is just an example of, of uh, number one, why we don't want guns on campus, but also a very active, proactive, I'm looking for Chief Heaton, yeah, very proactive a response chief to that situation, which I'm sure we would have too. But um, the, uh, the, the 10 states that have it allow the president ex uh, to name areas of exclusion. And so the, the Kansas system allows guns on campus, but there are large areas of the campus where guns are excluded. And the bill that was in front of South Dakota was allowed for no exclusions. So that you could have taken an AR-15 into this room or into Frost Arena on Saturday or to a basketball game. So it was a really troubling piece of legislation that, uh, that got a lot of attention. Uh, also worked on Tracy Green as just a superhero working with the board on the First Amendment situation. Uh, very complicated, uh, took a lot of time. Um, and the Student Association was with us uh, with both of these issues, uh, so we we did a lot of good work together with the with um, the students. Um, there was a bill passed, um, and and we're going to do a lot of training on First Amendment. And uh, the irony that then First Amendment rights have been restricted on protests uh, on the pipeline, it doesn't escape me or anybody else. So it's a really uh, uh, interesting, challenging time for higher ed and and uh, and we're working, we've been notified that diversity is kind of the next issue that we're gonna have to work on uh, for this next year. So have to pay attention and, and would really appreciate help from um, the Faculty Senate, which was very, they were very helpful on the other two items last year too, 
it'll take a real campus effort uh, to, uh, to work on uh, upcoming issues. We did get permission um, over the next few years to, to tear down Scobie Hall. Um, we got some permission to make some, do some land transactions that uh, will, will help us out um, uh, selling some properties, buying some more strategic properties. Uh, the ones we're selling we're not using and, and uh, so uh, it'll be, those, will, those were, are going to be very, very good for, for SDSU. The uh, Rural Veterinary Medicine, uh, Medical Education Program that, that we, we got permission from the legislature and the governor and so we're very excited about that to start a, a program with the University of Minnesota. So it's a real feather in our cap to uh, have a, a veterinary program um, in concert with a, the, one, of the, one of the very best veterinary medical programs in the United States. It's a two plus two program. We'll have two cohorts of 20. Provost Hedge is working with the University of Minnesota Provost to wrap that up and we're very excited about that. And that'll start in 2021. So it's uh, right, right around the corner actually. Um, <clears throat> on the Board of Regents, there's been lots of changes on, in, in the board itself. There's new members. There's an, uh, uh, during this last year, there was a new president, and uh, that's President Kevin Schieffer. He's been reelected for a second year as, as president of the board. Um, the, uh, that, I think certainly some good parts of that, but always with transition and new members, there's uh, a, a loss of institutional memory. Uh, Bob Sutton was a tremendous leader and still is, uh, but he retired to, from the Board of Regents and he took on the executive director and president of the Vera Health Systems, which is good for us too, but he was a tremendous leader. And so we've had some adjustments on in, in those leadership transitions. Um, you've seen the news about the University Center um, going to more of a community college model. Um, I signed the MOU this week. Um, it's uh, in the short run, it is, it's much better for us. Provost Hedge and uh, Vice President Corbin and I worked very hard on this. Uh, Tracy Green did. Uh, it, again, in the short term, this is really good for us. In the long term, it provides us the opportunity to offer associate degrees there, and uh, it's up to us. If, if we perform up to our potential, and offer those degrees, uh, this, this will be a good thing. We, we, we got a lowered tuition rate for out of the deal uh, for our courses, which we'd been almost penalized with, Dennis, before. Um, we, we, uh, uh, we, we do not have the overhead of the program and, and just lots of, lots of very positive things in the short term. But if we aren't aggressive about moving into that market with, with uh, uh, associate degrees and stackable programs, then, then we'll, um, the, the uh, cost in terms of losing that, that Sioux Falls market could be very, very serious to us. We have to look strong. We have to offer great pro the, the great programs we have in a new way in Sioux Falls. So, and we have to help young people transition then from Sioux Falls to up to, uh, to campus. So it's a lot of opportunities, uh, still a little bit unknown, but um, that's, uh, that's what's happening. And it's, gonna, it's, it's all in play and uh, should be approved at the, the May board meeting. The um, marketing communications team out of USD got way ahead of themselves. They were putting out news releases with, with the wrong name of the of, of the program and didn't summarize the MOU. And so there's been a lot of confusion about it, but I'll leave it at that. Um, the uh, two really great things that happened at the last Board of Regents meeting was naming opportunities for our Nest School of Management and Economics. And uh, we'll have an example of how powerful that can be in recruiting, but uh, very excited. I, I think Ellen is here and I see Matt and I'm sure many others from the from the econ department, this is a big, big step for us, and uh, it follow, follows on the heels of getting a, a degree in business economics, which again is uh, just a, a great step for us. And we want to thank Larry and Di Diane Ness for uh, uh, providing that five million dollar gift, and uh, it's just uh, uh, putting those resources to work will be a, a great, great thing for all of us. 
We also got pr pr permission to name the new Performing Arts Center, the Oscar Larson Performing Arts Center, that, and it's named after Dale Larson's father. And uh, I tease that we're gonna, uh, I, I look forward to the day, Maddie, when we have an, a person win an Oscar who performed in our Oscar Larson, right? <laughs> So that's kind of silly, but it is a beautiful facility, and I hope you've had an opportunity to, to, uh, uh, to go through it and visit it, and, and, and it will be uh, an enormous uh, improvement for us in, rec in recruiting, in student life, in community life, in your lives. And so it's a, a very, very uh, uh, wonderful addition to our campus. Um, so with that, I'm going to switch to the budget and turn it over to uh, Rob Corman. So uh, President Dunn has given me the easy topic to talk about. Um, so uh, many of you heard about the, uh, where we are with the, the budget, and we definitely have some uh, challenging opportunities. It's probably not what I, my first year here, it's not what I wanted to, to walk into. And um, every time the people get an email from me now or said Rob Corman called, they get these blank look on their face. And, and one, of, uh, one of the people said, do you feel safe walking across campus these days? So... Uh, <clears throat> Not sure, but I think there's a lot of optimism going forward. This is definitely going to be a challenging year, this being the development of the FY20 uh, uh, budget. Um, before I get into what the current budget situation that we're in and how we're going to work our way out of it, um, just a couple of uh, principles and how we're going to, where we sort of set the budget parameters around. Um, obviously, I, I'm going to let Mikhail's going to talk about the enrollment plan and some of the enrollment activities. So I'm going to pass on that piece in terms of implementation, but I will talk a little bit about the budget development. So one of the things we're really going to strive for, we are going to strive for, we are going to do is um, for the first time in many years, we're going to have a, a balanced budget for the university when we enter in on July 1st and on fiscal year um, 20. We're also going to make sure that there are structural bases are sound. So the budget that is balanced, it'll be structurally going sound for many, many years going forward. Uh, we've got some challenges in front of us in cleaning things up. Um, we're doing some strategic reallocations. As you probably heard, there has been some budget adjustments that have uh, been proposed around the university. Um, we have not done an across the board uh, uh, reduction um, in, in reallocation. They've been strategic in nature. Um, Dennis has done a fantastic job on the academic side. He's, he's met all the thresholds and he's put proposed some reductions uh, that are strategic on the academic side. And I've been working with the other vice presidents to make sure we have a sound uh, budget development on the, on the administrative side. Um, in terms of the two pieces we're making sure the budget includes is making sure we look at all efficiencies, both on the academic um, and, and the administrative side. Just a, a couple of examples that I'll, I'll point out is one we call shared services. Um, Mike Holbeck has led this initiative on the academic side where he's created an academic shared services where we have, we believe we can have better bench, bench strength that way of having fewer people to help manage um, some of the finances on the administrative side and then Mike has oversight um, and it can provide better guidance. We're doing the same thing on the administrative side. Um, we'll, we'll have, we're creating an administrative um, team that allow uh, my office to have better insight and oversight in terms of all of the administrative offices um, across the university. In terms of enhancing revenue generating opportunities, it obviously starts with the big one is, is, uh, is tuition, therefore coming from enrollment. And Michaela has done a fabulous job of developing an enrollment plan that is everything from different financial aid strategies to different recruiting strategies, which she's gonna talk about, which will definitely help us get out of uh, some of the financial, financial challenges. And then our, all of a sudden, also the partnership we have with the foundation, um, this wonderful building that we're in, they've been uh, wonderful partners in terms of helping us uh, look for other opportunities in terms of fundraising to help with scholarships and other activities and build buildings across the university. So um, what's, what the challenge we're facing is we have about a, a $7.7 million um, uh, budget, budget shortfall walking into the, walking into the year. Um, so it consists of basically three, uh, three areas. Um, <clears throat> one is our budget was not balanced walking into this year. Um, about $1.6 million, it was, it, was, it was out of balance. Um, part of that was from an enrollment shortfall that we didn't recognize walking into fiscal year 19. 
Um, part of it is from a couple of departments that did not have their own budgets balanced, and they walked in with anywhere from a $400,000 structural problem to a $700,000 structural problem. So that's part one. Um, part two is due to enrollment. Um, our enrollment, we had a loss of just over 400 students, which translates into a loss of about $4 million of, of tuition revenue, and that was for this year. And then we're also making a different change in terms of how we do budgets. We're also looking into the future so we can anticipate what enrollment drops may look like in the following years and build that into this year, into the FY20 budget as well. So because of a small class that was this year, that small class will have to go through the university as they come become um, sophomores, juniors, seniors, or they become uh, master students year one or PhD students year two. Um, that's gonna result into a, uh, an enrollment shortfall of about $1.3 million um, as well. So the enrollment problem is about $5.3 million. And then we have some additional other financial challenges that we have to take care of, um, where we've made commitments to various administrative uh, um, areas around the university that we have to solve their problems as well. Um, and so that's about another $900,000. So that's, those are the three components which are driving to the $7.7 .7 million structural deficit. So, again, this is what we have proposed right now. Nothing has been finalized. Again, the deans have been working with, uh, with Dennis in terms of providing uh, ideas and solutions, how to come up with some academic reductions, and then uh, the various vice presidents working myself and President Dunn in terms of looking at administrative reductions. Some of the proposed ideas right now is about a 5.4% uh, reduction um, on the academic side of the house. Um, that's about a $3.2 million uh, reduction on their side. It includes reduction of at least 18 faculty positions, but those positions, as I understand it, are all vacant or of upcoming retirement. So they're not eliminating filled faculty positions um, going into FY20. On the administrative side, um, we're looking at about uh, $3.5 million of reductions, about 5.7%. And those, even though those numbers are, are close, you should just please note that the administrative side is really taking a larger cut than we are to the academic side. One of my core values as being a CFO is to make sure we, uh, the, the academic side of the house needs to be bolstered, further enhanced, um, and take fewer cuts than the administrative side of the house. Um, this includes in, on the, the administrative side of the house over um, uh, 20 positions. Uh, again, the majority of those positions are all vacant positions or positions that have been, um, people are retiring. So. The challenge though, because we're both uh, the first and second bullet in the academic and administrative reductions are vacant positions. That means the money hasn't just been flowing free and sitting there. Those units, those colleges and divisions have been using those resources for other things. And so they are gonna have to look carefully in terms of how they spend their money into the future because those dollars um, will not be there. Um, we're gonna look at, again, the last piece is just about um, $800,000 worth of other reductions. And the primary thing what we're doing there is we're trying to eliminate what I call paying off our credit cards. We have, um, we have debt sitting with the foundation for capital projects that we have to pay for, plus the foundation on several of the projects are charging us 5.7% interest on those debts. So my goal is to reallocate some resources to buy down, that, buy down those debts so those debts no longer exist um, uh, on our books. Um, and again, I, I just want to reemphasize the major thing that I'm trying to push is making sure the university is on sound financial footing. I have guarded optimism going forward, um, especially on, on the enrollment side, where we expect to see uh, a decrease in enrollment because of the small class next year. I believe by fiscal year 21, we'll start to see an uptick in our enrollment across the board. And that's with very conservative um, enrollment estimates. So I'll be happy to take questions. Very doing questions at the end or during the process. At the end, okay. Well, thanks, Rob. Uh, you hear a lot about efficiencies, and the Board of Regents has made this a ma major priority of theirs. And um, with the utmost respect, I've been uh, using this slide all over uh, the state in my presentations. I also used it in the, my my, led, my presentation to the Appropriations Committee. I think this is really a powerful slide uh, because I think we are very efficient 
so if you use the cost calculator on our website and you use the cost calculator on the other four land grants that are up there, the U of M, UNL, Iowa State, and North Dakota State, uh, this is what comes up. Uh, we are very efficient at delivering uh, accredited uh, degrees in um, the classical land grant fields of agriculture, engineering, uh, um, uh, pre-professional programs, uh, pharmacy, nursing, et cetera. We are really, um, we, you do a great job, and I'm very, very grateful for it, uh, how well you're able to manage uh, the programs and the academic quality. Um, and I was bragging about Andrea Carlisle, where I don't know where Andrea is, Andrea Carlisle and the, the engineering folks winning all the uh, competitions that they they go in, and that, that's true in, uh, in the economic side. It's true all across campus. Student performance at, at um, professional meetings, whether it be a poster competition or the Honors College, Becky, just really super high levels of performance, and we're doing it at a fraction of the cost of our, our major competitors. So I'm, uh, I showed this at yesterday at the Council of Presidents meetings in Pierre. Um, I show it all the time. Uh, that we are very, very efficient. Um, the and so the cost of degree for, for us is a fraction of the percent uh, of an in-state Minnesota or, or, those, uh, or our neighbors to the north and south. So, uh, and I, I do though, we have to be very cognizant of the measures of efficiency that the, the Board of Regents looks at and those are, um, spatialization, program productivity, section size, and so uh, Provost Hedge and uh, works very hard with, with the, the deans and department heads on making sure, and Mary Kay Helling does a lot of the heavy lifting there, right Dennis? Um, on making sure that as we report out, and I can tell you on almost every measure of efficiency for the Board of Regents system, we're number one out of the six. So a lot to be proud of and, and I'm very, again I'm very very grateful for for your work um, how have we achieved that or what are we doing to continue that effort on efficiency certainly the college realignment uh, was um, designed to to uh, boost enrollment and set ourselves uh, apart in not only the arts but also the sciences the classical sciences and and we've I think we've done a, a good job at that and are seeing a response um, the, uh, the, um, the work done in the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences to consolidate smaller departments into larger schools. Uh, we've eliminated department heads when they retired, so it's, it's been uh, kind of a soft move that uh, is going to have a major impact. I think we're going to be able to highlight the excellent work in those schools uh, at, a, 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 I think, a, a much higher degree. So um, lots, of, lots of great work. Uh, we, uh, Becky Deegan, uh, I'm not sure if Becky's here or not, works in our uh, budget and finance office and, and has led um, 19 um, lean initiatives across campus from uh, the one that I think about was on scholarships where she worked, um, Steve, with, with your team here at the foundation. Uh, and really through that process, we, we and Michaela will highlight some of the um, the uh, changes that were made really did streamline uh, our scholarship process and, and made it much more effective and we're, we're seeing a response to that. Um, so a lot to be proud of on the efficiency side. I, you know, when you can offer a degree in engineering, Bruce, for uh, uh, the 60 some percent of the, the in-state price at Minnesota, we're, we're doing awfully good. Um, so I, I uh, politely push back, but, but at the same time, uh, we need to be leaders in efficiency. We need to be the leaders in spatialization. And uh, whether that's on dorms, Doug, I think Doug's here somewhere. Uh, so in dorms, Doug, we need to get, uh, make sure that we're, those numbers are high. We need to do it on the academic side too. That's why, we're, why we are removing SCOBY. Uh, not a nice, very nice place, and we've got some solutions. I, we know that that a couple departments are uh, in, the, in the basement of, um, of Hanson Hall and they've been there too long and we have some solutions coming for that. But, um, but, but we, have to be, uh, we have to look at all types of efficiencies. One thing, I, I just back up a couple of slides, I think. Um, 
I wanted to say before we move on. Um, that first bullet, strategic, and, and why I had that up there for the um, for this particular slide on on the uh, on the budget is that the work that you did, a lot of you did on strategic enrollment management, is the guiding principle underneath the budget decisions we've made. And I, I want you to, um, I'll say it again, the strategic enrollment management plan that was developed a year ago on which where we had opportunities for growth because of demand, that's, that is the underlying, underpinning um, uh, factor in the decisions we made about the budget. Does that make sense? We, this, that, it's a very strategic process. We, might, uh, we, we are going to certainly use some of those open positions or the retirements uh, to get us through this year, but in the long term, we're committed to that plan, Greg, that, that I know you and your team helped work on last year. Does that make sense, Matt? You, yep. So that's, uh, that's why that bullet was up there, and um, I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, so I'll go back to catch us back up here. So now um, we're going to ask Michaela Willis, Vice President of Student Affairs, to talk about um, proactive recruitment and marketing. Thanks, President Dunn. Um, before, uh, before I go into a couple of slides to talk about some of the new and exciting things that are happening and all of the work that's been happening throughout this year, I'd like to do two things. One is, if you're a member of the Strategic Enrollment Management Council, if you would stand, I would just like to recognize you and thank you for all of the work that you've done to make the plan come together and to work on implementing it. So if you guys would stand for me. I see many of you here. So thank you. And second, while I have the opportunity to really share some information on our proactive recruitment and marketing initiatives, I think there's some key players in the room that really make all the magic happen and have brought the ideas forward and have carried out those ideas and made them happen. And so I would like to recognize Sean Hembolt and the admissions team, Mike Lockerham and University Marketing and Communications team, and also Lindsay Hamlin and the Continuing and Distance Education team. They've put a lot of work, and there's many others, but they put a lot of work, energy, and effort into making this happen. So thank you to all of you for all your work in that area. <coughs> so there is an enormous amount of work that has gone into um, some of these initiatives that I'm going to talk about. And I'm just going to highlight a few key things that have happened throughout the year that, um, that I think are really important. So we launched several initiatives with EAB as our partner. One of those is our sophomore and junior search campaign where we reached out to over 75,000 students in their sophomore and junior year and started to promote South Dakota State University in new and different ways through a variety of multimedia approaches. We had about a 9.6% response rate on those campaigns up to this point, which is a little bit higher than the average response rate for most of the other campuses across the country that use EAB. So there's been a lot of work really done in that area. We've also enhanced how we communicate with prospective students um, from the admissions office. And um, text messaging is just one of those new avenues that we are using in the recruitment process in order to connect with students in, in new and different ways and in those ways that our students are used to using in, in very regular ways. And so um, there have been a lot of changes in what we do and how we use it, how we use our CRM tools and different things like that. So I wanted to highlight just a couple of those things that we're doing different. There's many, many others that, that are happening behind the scenes. Um, in fact, just the other day, President Dunn sent a note to um, Mike and Sean and myself to share with their teams that we um, had an individual reach out and say, you know, my granddaughter and my grandson are both looking at SDSU and my granddaughter's coming here in the fall, but I have to tell you from both of them, um, the level of personalization and the level of communication that we've received from South Dakota State University through the admissions office, through the academic departments, has really made the university stand out in some big ways. And so I think that's just a testament to the level of work and the amount of personalization and communication we really are doing with those students as we move forward. In addition, President Dunn mentioned we've made quite a few changes at the university around scholarships, and there have been 
couple of different scholarship task forces that um, their work has, has been implemented in some different ways. Um, the Jackrabbit Guarantee was updated for this fall class to really broaden and expand it and change a little bit of how, how we award that, that um, scholarship process. And we've received a lot of really positive feedback and um, some great acceptances back in that area. We're awarding scholarships earlier, both on the new student side and also on the returning student side. We even had a returning student say, I thought this was spam that came in my email because I'm getting this so much earlier than I ever have before. And so all of our returning students are receiving their scholarship notices before they leave this week from finals week. So we're really excited about some of the work and it's been hard work across the university to accomplish that. So we wanna recognize that. We have a new net price calculator that is more intuitive, provides more resources for students as they're really comparing the cost of South Dakota State University to many other institutions. So we have that implemented, um, have implemented some more flexible scholarship requirements and a number of other things in that area. All of those pieces together have really helped to enhance what we're doing to help students be successful at South Dakota State University um, and really achieve our access mission and help them in that way. From a marketing campaign perspective, um, and admissions and marketing have been working very closely together to implement a number of different things, but there's some things we're doing differently on the admitted to enrolled side. Um, with some multi-channel marketing approaches to prospective students. So whether that's letters in the mail or um, digital ads that are pushed to them through social media, um, different things, billboards, all sorts of different things that are happening in new and different ways. We launched our Plant Your Flag campaign and it's been fun to see from Sean in our regular meetings, all of the posters on social media, or all of the postings on social media from our students with their SDSU flag excited about coming and being a jackrabbit in the fall semester. So that's really been fun to watch that, that campaign really take off. We've personalized admitted student videos that have gone out to students. And then we also have been really monitoring the analytics to make sure that what we're doing is effective and, um, and is working. Through University Marketing and Communication and our partnership with Epicosity, we also have Rabbit Food, which is a series of different short clips and videos um, that talk about different topics about being a South Dakota State University student. And we've highlighted a lot of different things in that particular area for, um, for Rabbit Food. We've also featured some key programs that were identified in the Strategic Enrollment Management Plan for Growth. Um, we were able to really promote the new Ness School of Management and Economics through that rabbit food um, area in our engineering college. So there have been a lot of different things happening in, in those particular areas. But, um, but again, want to thank those of you that have been involved in really enhancing and being proactive in that recruitment and marketing initiative to, um, to bring in a great class for the fall semester. I just want to highlight that so if you think about that that last uh, targeted rabbit food so I think it was 3,300 um, engineering student or prospective engineering students out of that 75,000 3,300 had checked the box for engineering and so we've been interacting with them differently uh, and so we when all those um, how many contests did mechanical engineering win Bruce so just about everything they entered plus civil and Every time they, you know, our students did well, we let those 3,300 students know about what had been achieved. Same thing with the Nest School. As soon as we got that name, we, we emailed over 2,000 prospective uh, business students who had checked a box, I'm interested in a career in business, and, and fed them information to get the rabbit food thing. Um, not very tough. Uh, and, and, and so we're doing that on those two examples, but many others. Is that, so that's very, very different and, and very exciting. And we're doing it with, with the, we did it with the, um, the announcement on the, the veterinary science program. So, so uh, I, as I look across the room, Jane, you know, whatever it takes to reach out and, and interact with those um, pharmacy kids that, that are interested, whatever that is. So, so I, I encourage you to own this and, and be part of it. Um, lots of stuff going on this summer uh, in construction as usual, so um, hold on, right? Uh, watch out for uh, directions. Things will change a little bit. Um, 
I, I'm going to turn it over to back to Michaela to talk about the first of those. But North Campus Drive, uh, will didn't didn't quite get done before the weather set in, so uh, there'll be some changes on North Campus Drive, and and uh, so there are some some big projects that will impact us th this summer, and we wanted you to know about them. So we're uh, I think Michaela is going to go over the first three, and then Provost Hedge, uh, a group of them, and then Rob's going to finish up. So Michaela. Okay, so there's a lot of exciting things happening around campus. One of those is our American Indian Student Center. It was kind of fun this week to see some of the steel starting to go up um, on that particular site. But the American Indian Student Center will provide physical environment and amenities to support the expansion of the American Indian Student Services and programs here. But um, the new facility will also be a prominent addition to the main campus and highlight the significance of the Wakini Initiative. The new facility will include a general classroom, multi-purpose room, a student suite, as well as offices for the staff in the American Indian Student Center. So there will be a lot of opportunities to use this, not just for um, things related to the American Indian Student Center programming, but across campus. And so we hope that as that, um, as that uh, opens up next spring, you will, um, you'll find some opportunities to utilize that space. It's going to be about 12,000 square feet. Um, it will have a main level and then there will be a, a small upper level as well with it. When we move on to the South Southeast University neighborhood and the apartment project, we're really excited about how that particular project has come together for us. It has a 156 bed apartment complex and which I can say is full. All beds are rented, so that's super exciting. In that, it's a combination of one, two, three, and four bedroom units in those apartments, um, and there's, totally, uh, there's a total of 45 units. There's two one-bedroom units, um, seven two-bedroom, four three-bedroom, and 32 four-bedroom units in that. In addition, we have five townhouses that are a part of that. Those are each um, divided into three separate units with four bedrooms in each of those units. Um, we are starting to fill those up and I think we're about a third of the way full in the, um, the townhouse units, but there's 60 total beds in that area and five of those are ADA accessible units as well. So we also saw the walls begin to be erected and um, for the Starbucks that will be on campus, that will be a full service Starbucks at South Dakota State University. And um, they've been doing some really cool things with the artwork to really tie it in and make it, make it SDSU. So um, it'll be a great, great space for students to study and for you guys to hold meetings and, and go and have a cup of coffee. Um, that will be complete and ready to occupy in August, and so students will start moving in here in August, not too far away from right now. The last project that I'll talk about is some renovations to the Student Union. We have about a $1.2 million renovation project that will start this summer and conclude maybe by the end of October. October to sometime in November. We're, we're still finalizing all of the details. That project is funded through our maintenance and repair dollars for the student union. This is going to be phase one of a three-phase project um, with a substantial completion, like I said, towards the end of October to maybe early November in there. With the first phase of the renovation, we're going to be relocating the Office of Multicultural Affairs up to the second level at the top of the main um, staircase in that particular area. Um, it'll definitely provide some increased prominence for the Office of Multicultural Affairs. We're really excited about that. We will be relocating temporarily the three conference rooms that that space will overtake um, to the lower level. And then when we get into phase two and phase three, we'll create the permanent conference rooms and conference spaces in those particular areas. And then the Cottonwood Conference Room, which um, will be renovated as well. And that particular conference room will really set the design standards for the rest of the conference room upgrades and facilities. Phase two will focus on student organization space and uh, um, a standalone center or a, um, a center within the union specifically for career development. So that will be phase two. And then phase three will include conference and VBR upgrades. And so phase two and phase three, we'll see um, if they stay in that order if, or if we'll move them around a little bit, but we're really excited excited to move that project forward and we're excited to see construction start this spring or this summer. So I'll turn it over to Dennis and he'll talk a little bit about a few other areas.
Thanks, Michaela, and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, you know, before I before I go through mine, just very quickly, um, wanted to say um, thanks, uh, thanks. You know, here we're at the end of an academic year. Um, and my remarks to campus through our, our little newsletter we put out, you know, I, I, I mentioned hopefully you take great pride in, uh, in our work. Uh, so, so again, I hope that over the course of the next three or four days, uh, as we watch our graduates and participate in these very important ceremonies, uh, that uh, indeed you, you, you take great pride in that uh, because uh, that's what it's all about and that's the product of your work. Uh, so it's not lost on me, but thank you uh, for all you do to contribute to their success. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to go through the next projects, um, really five projects that have, to some degree, an academic link or an academic component uh, associated associated with them, academic and research component associated with them. Um, so these projects, uh, the first one I'll, I'll walk through, Animal Disease Research and Diagnostic Laboratory. So just really a fantastic pro uh, a fantastic project. Um, and I think I saw maybe Jane come uh, come in here. Jane and Eric, oh, standing back there. There, I just didn't get quite quite that far. But really, a game changer for us. Um, so that's a that's a wonderful project, eighty thousand square foot edition, and really it enables a lot of things for us that we have not. Uh, would not be able to do. Um, and, and, and I think even more importantly than that, in addition to enabling it, it also enables us to do that in a safe environment, uh, which is equally very, very important for us, uh, right? So, so we're able to continue to serve uh, the, the, the region um, on, on broad scale, and at the same time, uh, that impactful work is able to be done in a safe environment, and that's, uh, that's fantastic for us. The ADRDL project itself, so uh, work uh, continues to be done. Dean tells me that uh, in September, uh, we'll, we'll have it officially all the way wrapped up uh, but, uh, but but again um, that's for phase one there is a secondary phase associated with the ADRDL project and that is to renovate what what has been the, the, the current or previous uh, ADRDL facility, and that involves some mechanical work as far as, and, some, and some exterior work, and will also be uh, very enabling for us, too, as we look at the Rural Vet Med Program uh, and what then we need to, to, need to do there. Uh, so again, that's really important to us as we look at our strategic priorities and what we're able to move forward, so the ADRDL project. Uh, the next project up there is, is the barn, so the intramural building, and I think um, where I'd start is again just to kind of invite people to, to I mean maybe you've you've heard this so hopefully this is a little bit familiar but really the overall strategy that we're working with with the barn is to renovate and create a home for the school of design uh, so so I think that's the one thing that I want you to understand about the barn and, and and some of the moves that are being made there it's about creating renovating space and creating a space that becomes the home of the school design. So all of the associated programs, bringing them together, whether that be interior design, landscape architecture, uh, the 3D art, uh, ceramics, so on and so forth. Right? So getting them all uh, centrally located, including the freshman studio. Um, so that work, there's been work that's been ongoing there actually for, for some time. Um, and again, this is a project that we've really divided up into two uh, component phases. Uh, phase one, um, going on through, we would anticipate at least through FY22, primary emphasis really has been on maintenance and repair, so a lot of different things, but at the same time, also doing some other foundational work that facilitates some moves and, um, and, and even a classroom modernization along the way here or there too as we uh, do additional moves on our campus so that we make sure that we don't leave ourselves short. So that's been a really important part of the phase one. Now phase two is a little bit more dependent um, upon uh, some fundraising and some other things that we will do, but that'll be where we get more specifically into the programmatic elements that we're talking about within the School of Design. Now, when I mentioned the fundraising, I have great high hopes for, for, for our fundraising potential here. Um, it, and, and for those of you that have been participants in the Jackrabbit Philanthropy Academy, and we're starting to talk about the overarching case statements. Uh, so we have a category of restoring the glory um, and, and this is one of the Restoring the Glory projects. Uh, and again, it, it has resonated well. It resonated well when we did our, our, um, our, our conversations that we had as we uh, did the build out of the case statement and other things like that. So we feel really good about where we're positioned there, uh, but yet there will be some fundraising work. But I think if you really envision what can be achieved there with uh, that beautiful architecture of the intramural building and preserving its historical significance on our campus really does become an important project. So it's one that I, I, I get excited about as well. The third up there uh, that we have is Lincoln Music Hall, another um, wonderful historic uh, project. 
um, I think, and um, a very important building to us. It also is one of those items when you will, you know, kind of take a look at the uh, restoring the glory component of the overarching case statement, you will, you will find it there. Um, now, that being said, um, so we've had fundraising work to do. That being said, they're actually, so over the course of the summer, so in all of these five projects, which is why they're, they're picked, you will see some work um, being done. And in fact, if you walk by the building, you'll see a little bit of work that's being done there now. The work that's being done uh, there right now uh, would include things that we really need to do in order to make the facility usable, even over the short term, uh, to be honest. I mean, so, so there are some, some, some asbestos abatement project and, and exterior masonry repairs that really were absolute must that, that, that have to occur. And on the inside, we're actually working on a few spaces. Uh, Dean and his team have been working on that. Um, spaces that, uh, again, provide a little bit of flexibility in regard to what we may uh, ultimately want to do uh, with Lincoln. So it could provide us um, opportunities in regard to classroom, but could also provide us some other opportunities to locate other important things on our campus, whether that be for a short period of time or a longer period of time. Um, so the work that's being done there right now, again, it, it, it's important work. It helps really in regard to the long-term uh, viability of the building, but also provides some added flexibility that I think will be important to us as we navigate over the next couple of years. So you'll see some work over there, and that's primarily that. But remember, the bigger piece will be an overall more grand um, effort, uh, ultimately, around uh, Lincoln that will involve some fundraising. Um, co mentioned a couple of other things. Wagner Hall is up uh, is up there as well. Uh, Wagner, um, a, a unique project, but, it, you know, uh, onto its own, but it, there is some uh, some connection to what we were talking about with uh, with the barn, um, primarily because we've had um, uh, health and nutritional sciences located in the barn, so it's part of the orchestrated moves, if you will, of taking faculty members that were in the barn and locating them over to Wagner Hall, and we've been in the process of doing that actually over the past couple of years as well, and again, making, making good progress there. The vision, ultimately, with respect to Wagner Hall is to create a, a, a building that really does have a health sciences emphasis. So certainly we know our, our College of Nursing is there, and then also then the health sciences. We think, uh, again, as we look longer term, President talked about efficiencies, by locating, uh, by co-locating um, um, uh, programs, obviously, that have that level of connection, we may be able to identify some additional operating efficiencies through those kinds of things. And of course, that's what we would, uh, that's what we would hope to do. So a little bit of the background in regard to what's playing out there. Um, and a, an important project that uh, I think you'll see probably next summer is um, a simulation facility for the College of Nursing. I think actually, uh, I think Roberta is actually in Sioux Falls today, but, uh, um, but, but we're, we're nearing, um, our fundraising goal for that project. Um, we have a, an important fundraising meeting actually tonight. So as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to go join them, and we're going to we're going to continue to work on that. But um, we're we're making good progress against that. That will allow us then to move forward probably next summer. So not this summer, but next summer, uh, with a nice upgrade for our uh, nursing simulation facility that we have there on campus. So that continues to play out. And then the last building that we'll mention is uh, really a massive project. Um, and, and again, a very exciting project, Ra Raven Precision Agriculture Center. So 129,000 square foot, foot building. And I think really for us, um, I think of it as a game changer in many ways. Um, certainly there's been a lot of excitement and momentum around the Precision Ag project itself, including the major. Um, but that building will feature office spaces. It'll feature classroom facilities. Um, it'll feature collaborative environments in order to uh, help stimulate great ideas uh, that then will play out in our research laboratories and other uh, teaching and learning environments. Uh, so we anticipate the construction to begin very late this, uh, this summer or early fall. And then uh, that project will take uh, the better part probably of about two years uh, with uh, probably an anticipated opening for uh, fall 20, 2021. Uh, anyway, and those are mine, and then I'll pass it off to Rob here for the next project. So just wow. I mean, it's what you think about that list, you think about all that we've accomplished, and this doesn't include things we've just completed like um, uh, PAC, uh, the Harding renovation, uh, the new wellness. And if, so if you added up all of those projects and the list here, that's over a quarter of a billion dollars. 
in capital infrastructure. We've added, and we are have at, recently added, or going to be adding shortly. It's just, it's just an amazing, amazing feat. And I can't imagine what the campus looked like five or six years ago. It's just transformational, and this has a huge impact on on our maybe not the construction part in the summer, but when the, when it's all completed on students and when they're uh, when they're wanting to come here. Um, and also, I just wanted to give a shout out to to Dean. Um, he's over there someplace. Hi, Dean. Um, and all the things that he's going to be doing this summer, he's promised, he just said he bought a bed that's going to be in his office and he's not leaving from May 1st until November. So we appreciate all your hard work on that, on that, Dean. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, just one, one last project I'll turn over for, uh, questions and that's, this is, it's, it might have a little bit of a, uh, disruption for the center of campus. That's the Campanile Avenue. That's going to go from, uh, the central heating plant to, to Jaeger and that's phase one and then a, a turn around the following summer and that'll be from the heating plant to uh, to, um, to Harding and that's phase two but the road will be torn up that's everything from underground water sanitary sewer um, campus lighting we'll also do some landscaping as well but it is going to have a little bit of disruption for those of you who um, who use that thoroughfare uh, on a daily basis but again just all of the projects we're doing is really is just transformational to this campus and really will bolster us uh, going forward our infrastructure um, and again, we can't thank Dean and, uh, and his team enough for all of the hard work they have put forth and also our folks with the foundation, all the private money they've helped us raise. Um, and also a, a shout out to the students as well. The students have developed a GAF strategic plan um, and are helping with some of these infrastructure projects as well. So I believe that's our last slide. I think, uh, and take any questions for, for all of us. All the hard questions go to Dennis. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll have Dennis help me. Um, Told you gets all the hard questions. <laughs> so I'm trying to remember exactly, Don. But basically, what we've been we've been asking for and working toward was to get um, a, a a tuition price point that uh, does reflect the associate's degree rate, um, which is um, I've drawn a blank on what it is. Two seven two two seven two seven two two. Yeah, seven. The, the the new number with the increase in tuition, I think, is 275. I think it was 265 last yeah. year. Yeah. So, so at that at that number, what we've always been asking for, what we believe would would really help us, is um, for other programs. So, if we had bachelor's program or something else like that, that it, that, that if we were in a situation to where um, to where if we if we wanted so 100 200 level tuition rates we could offer them at the same at the same price point. I think um, what, what what we believe uh, and I think there's some evidence to support it and I'll just leave it at that is that um, uh, under the previous where you have different uh, uh, different levels of tuition that there would be an incentive for example to um, declare as a general study student. Uh, and of course, one institution not named South Dakota State um, was able to offer that. Uh, and therefore, I believe that put us at a competitive disadvantage. And one of the things we really uh, worked toward was to try to level that playing field and allow us to compete. Yeah, so, so under the, the agreement that's just running out, Don, uh, we, we had to offer courses at self-support, which is 355 or 360. And USD got to offer them for 265. So, you know, so we got the playing floor leveled. We're all offering one and 200 level courses on site at the same price, and uh, online courses are are at the same price too. But it's a big, big difference for us. Is that? No, you're you're exactly you're exactly right, Don. I, I I mean certainly we don't want to create back end you know back end pathways or anything like that. We're pretty confident that with the market that's there, that will not occur. And again, you know you're measuring upside again. You know what's the potential win? What's the potential um, you know high end ceiling potential versus versus the loss? I'm pretty convinced that we've suffered some losses and and students have migrated away from us and. Of course, um, you know, when that happens, and, and oftentimes they become more familiar with a different institution, it's always hard to win them back. Uh, so, so that's why we believe uh, this becomes a better strategy for us.
So that's a great question, Don. And, and, we, and we were very conscious of that as well. Just, you bring a good point. Yeah, and I think it's nearly 40% of the graduates from all the high schools in Sioux Falls don't go anywhere. They don't go to the, the armed services. They don't go to tech school. They don't go. So price is important, Don. And really, if we could combine this with, with the Code of Promise, which we have some promise uh, to, of getting, I think we'd be, we're going to attract an, a group of young people that were really are getting left behind in, in Sioux Falls. So our target, our target, it's a fine balance. It isn't to rob students from our campus, but it's to get students that we're absolutely not serving. I wait uncomfortably here. A <laughs> uh, big shout out to Andy uh, Fulberg and Kayla and the whole team from the Alumni Association for hosting us. So help me thank the Alumni Association. <laughs> and, th and the other one is to SCSU Foundation. I know Steve's here. I don't know if others are here, but uh, just Steve, you just uh, they brought in $58 million last year. Uh, sixth year in a row over 50 million dollars if i get this right um have a 70 million dollar goal for this year um first quarter of this year was the highest first quarter we've ever had so a really hard working team at the sdsu foundation that just uh is, is an incredible difference maker for us so help me thank the sdsu foundation <laughs> now you've got to ask questions here Uh, yeah, I'm John Christensen, Human Resources, if for some of you I haven't met. But my question is, have online classes, have, has that drawn, you know, any students off campus that typically we would see on campus enrolling in <laughs> residence halls? And do we have any idea on that or how that's trending? So, so John, I want to make sure I understand. So your question, so, so are we you know, is online growing at the expense of, of on-campus type, yeah, type, type yep. things? Okay, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question as well. And again, I, so I've got, uh, I can always phone a friend here too, right? Because I've got, I've got other people. So Lindsay, you can, uh, if you've got additional information. So th th the simple answer to that, I think, uh, right out of the chute, John, would be there's no evidence that would indicate that that's, that that's the case. I think really what the evidence um, uh, that, that exists out there, what it indicates is that um, our students continue to evolve and change. And they continue to evolve and change in that they are seeking access to education and, and consuming courses, if you will, in a variety of different modalities. Uh, so your, your on-campus student that uh, we're delivering a lot of face-to-face -face classes, Lindsay, I, I don't know the exact number, but a fairly high percentage are also involved in online education right now. 44%. So, 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 so anyway, I mean, I think that's more the shifting and the migrating that we're seeing is one in which it's very blended right now, John, and not necessarily to where, where there are offsets, uh, if you will. Uh, so we're pulling people away. Now, that being said, I think really the challenge is that uh, we have to recognize that. And I really do believe, again, and I think it's, it's something that we at SDSU have always prided ourselves on, is access. And access, I think, takes many, many different shapes and forms. Um, and one of the access issues is meeting students where they're at. And that does mean we need to continue to be pretty creative at, at, at doing things and bringing smart, you know, smartly thinking through programs and bringing those or taking those offerings to students. And if that means doing so in an online environment, because that's the way access to education is best for them we need to embrace it and it's certainly part of my ongoing conversations with Lindsay and and it and it has to be part of our future here at SDSU yeah I, my uh, question on that which I get a lot as I go around the state um, the you know we're not a small liberal liberal arts college uh, so the experiential learning type courses and degree programs that we offer in natural resource management, uh, Michelle, or pharmacy, nursing, uh, agriculture, engineering, those, especially those upper division courses, we want 
kids with their hands on a project and uh, senior design projects. And so it, as pragmatic as our degrees are, John, I think uh, we can offer lots of degree programs and we certainly want to offer more online, but some of them, pharmacy, nursing, and all those ones I just listed, uh, th there's an awful lot of those uh, courses which will never be online because we, we want them in laboratories um, with hands-on. Uh, a lot of the speech courses, I, I'm not sure how you teach speech online, I can't figure it out, but I'll, go, I'll go with it. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, the, I, I think we'll always be heavy on experiential type courses that are, are, are you know, grounded in um, a real high level of contact with, uh, with, with faculty members. Andrea. <laughs> Andrea beat you to the mic, Paul. So with recruitment and retention, obviously a major source of some of our financial yeah. woes, if that's okay to use that word. What can we as individual faculty members do? Like what's your marching orders to us to help with recruitment um, in particular? Or how do we be a part of that process? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think there's a couple of things, and some of them are very simple. It's the small things that we do um, each and every day. When we see a family walking across campus saying, hello, welcome to South Dakota State University, hope you become a jackrabbit. That's something that each and every one of us in this room can do, really making people feel welcome and like they're already a part of the jackrabbit family. Um, the other things that you can do, um, accept campus visit appointments from our Office of Admissions and really do a great job of promoting all of the unique things that your academic programs have to offer those students because as faculty members in particular, department heads, deans, what you say and taking the time to sit down and meet with a student one-on-one, -on -one, that matters. That matters a lot to those prospective students and families that you've taken time out of your day to meet with them and share all of the exciting things that are happening. So I think those are a couple of different things that we can all do to help really welcome those students and make them feel like they're already a part of the Jackrabbit family. Of course, there's many more. We have admissions events that we would love to have you be a part of. Um, and also as you're out there with your family, talking about South Dakota State and all of the wonderful things that we're doing here as a university, inviting people to come and visit campus, sharing what we're doing with them, that word of mouth really does make a difference. When we talk to students, um, prospective students and their families, word of mouth is a big deal um, in how they find out about it at South Dakota State University and decide to come for that campus visit. And so talking to your kids about it, talking to their teachers, talking to the principal about the value of a four-year degree at South Dakota State University, those are things that you can do in order to really spread the word about the positive things that are happening. And also wear the, gold, the yellow and blue everywhere that you go. So. And if I may, I want to touch on the retention side just, just real quick. Um, and, and here we are at the end of an academic year. I'm going to ask you to think back to the way we started our academic year. You remember? In August, we had a, we, we, we had a session. Uh, maybe people don't remember. But we had a session, and we talked a little bit about some of the things uh, that we can do, right? Um, things that we can do that really can make an impact in regard to, to, to the retention side. And, and, and there were about four or five different strategies, but, but some of them were as simple as, again, helping students feel their way, right? Helping them find purpose or meaning in what they're learning about helping them feel connected to the university by getting to know them just a little bit, even first names and, 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 and little things like that. They, you know, there's a lot of evidence that says that that makes a big difference. Challenging our students, right? Pushing them. They, wanna, they, they, wanna, they want an academic challenge. Um, now, they also want us to work with them to make sure that we're helping them get over those higher academic hurdles. But if you think back, again, I thought, thought that was a wonderful way to begin the academic year. And, um, maybe maybe your homework exercise. I'm giving out homework here today, but maybe you know would be to to reflect back a little bit upon the way that we started our academic year because I think that there were some really helpful hints um, during that session. And again, as Michaela said, a lot of this is not overly complicated, but it does require intentional effort. 
And I know we do that, but it's like anything else in human nature. Sometimes there's a little bit of slippage when we all get a little bit busy. So anyway, thanks for asking the question. Most all of the comments today were on the teaching side as far as budget's concerned. Is there any comments on the research or extension side? Well, thanks, Paul, and I'll turn that over to Vice President Scholl, who's uh, our Vice President of Research and Economic Development. Thank you, Paul. Um, certainly, uh, at, a, at a land grant university, education and research aren't separable from one another. They impact uh, one another in, in a lot of different ways in both directions. And of course, what happens with uh, education-related revenues has an impact on, on research because to some degree that underwrites some, some aspects or uh, part of the, the research and scholarship uh, that we do. But um, as far as budget and appropriations go, I would say number one, this year uh, for research and extension, um, it, it was a good thing that we came out of the legislative session without a loss and with uh, some plus ups in key areas that will feed into research. I want to go back to the uh, uh, project list, the, the capital project list uh, that was addressed earlier. The Animal Disease Research and Diagnostic Lab, uh, Provost Hedge described that as a game changer uh, for a lot of reasons. And one of those reasons is, you know, in the name of that, it's the Animal Disease Research and diagnostic lab, and it's often thought about as the diagnostic lab, but uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Christopher Hennings will tell you in a heartbeat that uh, the research and diagnostics go together, and the fact is that um, uh, materials coming in for diagnostics feed research, and in the research turnaround and enable diagnostics, and the research that's fed by the diagnostic material coming in is very responsive research, responsive to the disease problems that are unfolding in real time, in reality, and represent a, a real and present need by the population that this university and, and this diagnostic lab uh, that the university has the privilege of uh, 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 running uh, serves. And so that's very important. And in fact, a lot of our research success, some of our outstanding historical and current research success at South Dakota State University is related to animal health. And, and that's a, uh, that will continue to be the case as we move into this space that uh, enables greater throughput of diagnostic material and um, uh, working with diagnostic material with infectious uh, agents under safe conditions, safe for the operators, safe for the environment outside the laboratory. Uh, those who are, of you who are familiar with biosafety levels, we're talking about biosafety level three safety. So that's, that's pretty special. Um, much broader picture than that. Now still, this is going to be an agricultural example that, that gets to your question, but much broader picture than that, the funding landscape at the federal level is a long-term project. We think about it in terms of we submit proposals, and, and if they are proposals that are high quality and that resonate with the uh, 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 scientific uh, picture, if you will, and the members of, of review panels when, the, when those are successful proposals. But even before that, it starts with decisions that are made in Congress as far as um, uh, authorization for programs, followed by budgeting, followed by appropriations. It's only after that third step that money gets into the agency's budgets with which they can run competitive research programs. This last year, so in the, in the fall, the uh, uh, current version of the Farm Bill was passed. And uh, we, as a university, had the privilege of being involved in that. And maybe many of you have heard this story already. If you get tired of it, well, that's OK. Too bad, because this is really important. Um, yeah, that was funny. You can laugh. <laughs> um, I heard a chuckle behind me, so that was good. Um, 
early, early on in the Farm Bill negotiation process, over a year before Congress passed the Farm Bill, we were working with our members of Congress and with some folks in, in uh, uh, the USDA to insert language that is relevant to SDSU research strengths and relevant to the population that we serve on the subject of soil health. The result was is that soil health language was introduced into the Farm Bill partly because of, of our involvement in three different places of the Farm Bill. And now, on Monday of uh, next week, I have an appointment, and you don't know this yet, but I have an appointment, so I'll miss the senior leadership team meeting, <laughs> with um, three of the uh, regulation writers in the Natural Resource and Conservation Service about how to craft the regulations that implement the Farm Bill provisions in such a way that South Dakota and Northern Great Plains uh, uh, users can most benefit. And of course, right in there will be how to partner with land grant universities. That sets up competitive uh, programs that our faculty, our research and extension faculty can successfully compete for. So those are some of the big uh, picture things that we're doing, have done, have succeeded at, and that set faculty up. But the, the key remains, and this is, this is a, a very important message, it's one thing to submit proposals. It's another thing to turn those pr submitted proposals into awarded grants and contracts. And that's where you, at the level of your units, really have to engage and be strategic about how expertise and time is allocated so that we don't just submit proposals, but we sub submit proposals for which the effort and, and focus has been uh, uh, applied to make those competitive proposals so that the work can actually be carried out here. And, and you'll see more, af more focus on that coming from the research leadership around the university, the division, and um, in the colleges on converting, uh, converting proposals to awards. Very, very important. I, Paul, I think that it's a fabulous question. I, um, certainly the, the drop in, re in revenue this year was uh, associated with um, a drop in student credit hours. So the major impact of these cuts is on academics. And I think we've done a good job. I'm sure there'll be some impact on research, but um, I think we've done a good job at protecting, if you will, research and extension. Lots of activities, Paul, on the research side from cancer, great cancer work in the uh, College of Pharmacy, a new lab. We, we built a new, or they built a new lab, so we expanded the lab resources there. Uh, a new experiment station, as you know, in Sturgis. That's why we're selling some land to, to really empower our, our, our ag research across the state, moving on the extension side, moving the West River Ag Center. Uh, and the Regional Extension Center into a new building in a high profile space. Again, uh, selling some resources to, to p position us for the future. It's really exciting stuff. That's all across the state, Paul. And on the, on the research side, i really proud of uh, the Natural Resource Management Team along with Biosystems Engineering had a demonstration project on the impact of, I got this right, Michelle, the impact of the positive impact of precision agriculture and the potential of that on, it, on its impact on natural resources. And we used that model to leverage into a million dollar grant from the state of South Dakota, and which will be leveraged several times again for several million dollars more with pheasants and ducks and other NGOs uh, in a very exciting program called Every Acre Counts that, that the NRM team is, is a big part of. Showing, uh, uh, showcasing precision ag's impact on the uh, on our environment, uh, the positive impact precision ag can have on the on the environment. So, uh, forty thousand acres of, of demonstration, probably one of the greatest demonstration projects and extension Paul we've ever had. So, lots of exciting things. Does that make sense? Good afternoon, um, Joe Santos, Department of Economics, School, <laughs> Nest School of Management <laughs> Economics. Forgive me. So I'm going to I want to piggyback on Andrea's question, if I may, in the context of research. Um, without making this too profound, um, what do we do to preserve 
the culture of the book. Yeah, I mean the culture in our society. Uh, Stanford University Press was about two days away from sacking, uh, or Stanford University was about two days away from sacking Stanford University Press this week. Um, in that cultural environment, what can we do um, as a university uh, to preserve the culture of literary studies, of, if I may, arts, humanities, and social sciences? Um, you wouldn't think this value proposition would be as difficult to make um, as it seems to be. Um, but our democracy and our life as we know it <laughs> depends on preserving this. And I, I, I'd like to know how we as a university can behave in order to, uh, to succeed in this way. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly don't have all the answers, um, Joe, and um, I'll, give it, I'll give it a shot. And uh, as I've interacted with literally Fortune 100 companies um, about the, the and, and getting really strong and honest feedback about what our, our graduates uh, need to kind of look like, what skills they need to have. Um, certainly there's, a, there's a, just a, an assumption that they're mature, that they, that they, are, uh, that they understand everything that, that your team teaches in the e-trading room. Uh, there's just an assumption that those skill levels, whether it be engineering, pharmacy, nursing, are there. But what they're looking for is, um, and this is, so I'm ready to do battle on diversity, I'll tell you. Um, what they're looking for over and over again is communication skills, team skills, uh, participation in, a, in that democracy, uh, understanding the world around them. Uh, and so diversity is mentioned over and over again. The importance of a... And, of a worldview, of, of understand, have they gone on a uh, study abroad? Have they even traveled abroad? I mean, that's the kind of, the expectation is that our students will have traveled abroad, understand the world around them in, in this complex world, understand religion and, and as governments, et cetera. Uh, and, and that's what they're looking for. They expect the rest. And they're looking for that icing on the cake, which is, is what I think you described. And um, uh, last week at the Council of Trustees meeting, one of our alums, who's a new member of the Council of Trustees, um, talked about her experience at SDSU being a portal to the world. And uh, it's just an incredible quote. That's how she described it. That's exactly what uh, employers uh, are looking for uh, of, of our graduates. That's what we are all looking for. Um, what I worry about, uh, if, we, if, we, if we leave those kids that, that, uh, in Sioux Falls out of the equation, our democracy is at risk. 40% of the kids doing nothing, you know, uh, no offense to McDonald's, but going to work for McDonald's, that's not healthy for our democracy, our society. We need people ready to participate in school boards and uh, city councils and that, so. Uh, that's our work, Joe, is we cannot give that up. And in fact, the pressure, I feel, is for more of it and richer, better communicators, having a richer understanding, all those um, trips to China that will start next week and all across the, that's what they're looking for. And uh, that's, uh, you know, that's where the future is. So I think we just stay strong and articulate that every chance you get. I articulate it every chance I get. It's a great, great question. I leave it to others too. So. Sure. I can't pass up the opportunity and thank you for the question, Joe. But uh, I think uh, you asked what can we as a university do and us as individuals and, as, and uh, in our various roles of uh, uh, leadership and being on the front lines with engaging with students and engaging with ideas. So that's the research and scholarship creative activity function of, of a faculty member. In, in a phrase, I would say, never give up on the scholarship. Work really, really, really hard. No matter what the teaching challenges are, no matter what the enrollment challenges are, never give up on the scholarship. And, and, and don't view discipline our, we need to, I think we should discipline ourselves to not view education and scholarship as competing things. Yes, we only have so much time to allocate, but these two things feed one another to, to be at their best. They both, in, in a land-grant university, they depend on one another. And so I challenge all of us to think about what can we do differently? 
to elevate our, our scholarship and our creative activity. So I'm thinking specifically of the arts and humanities when I use uh, that, that vocabulary. Um, and, and that includes doing things that are different, doing things that are new, trying new things. And, and for, for many, that may be looking for sponsorships that are enabling, that enable work to be done that couldn't be done otherwise when it's difficult and when it's not part of our, our habit, part of our uh, 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 normal way of, of working, but never give up on the scholarship because that's, that's, that's the fire, so to speak. Joe, uh, I'll, I'll pick that up again. Sorry to hone in on you here. So it's to everybody. But so having a robust faculty is absolutely key. Uh, one of the, of the case statements that we've made about the next capital campaign for the university with, uh, in partnership with the SDSU Foundation is to go from, um, so our, our last goal uh, in our last strategic plan was to have 16 endowed positions, right, Steve? And we're at 21 now. Uh, our goal is 50. Uh, we want to enhance facu faculty uh, to celebrate them, add, bring resources uh, to it. That's, that's one way you do it because that buys time, it buys summer experiences for the faculty. Um, so that, that is, how does it manifest itself? What are we doing about it? We're making that a big priority of the next capital campaign as we visit with donors. And Dennis did a great job last week uh, visiting with the uh, Council of Trustees in this room about the what is an endowed position? Why does it matter in plant science, David? Or why does it matter in, in uh, management or economics, Joe? So um, let's, let's go for 75. I mean, let's not stop at 50. So. David Davis, I'm also from the Ness School of Management Economics. We kind of run in pairs. Um, we, so we know that enrollment numbers are down, um, but we've had some initiatives underway for a few years now to address retention yeah. and also graduation rates. Can we speak to any movement on any of those numbers? I'll, well, Michaela's coming up. I'll tell you an interesting thing about graduation rates, David. We award, last year, in, in we awarded more degrees than we've ever awarded before within in a in a 12 month period and that's because dual credit and dropping 128 i remember <laughs> visiting with don marshall about this many many times 128 to 120 we sped up the the awarding of degrees so in one measure we're very efficient we awarded 2600 and some degrees last year the most we've ever awarded and and we have fewer kids on campus so it's a it's a conundrum uh, it's some, a real win on one side. Graduation rates, I'll turn it over to Michaela and shut up here. Gradu uh, uh, which one is it? Um, Four-year graduation rate is, is going up, which is a good thing. But that actually lowers enrollment uh, versus the, this is the best five, fifth, you know, this is the best five or six years of your life. That's gone. Uh, and, but the price tag of that is what Rob brought up. Because it's impacted it, our 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 econo our business model. I think the other thing I will share is you know as you look at our enrollment management plan, there are a number of priorities really focused on recruitment or on retention and student success, which um, which to me is is commencement and graduation. And so as you look at that, our student success committee has been working hard all year to really evaluate and start to make recommendations forward on um, how we can start to move those metrics in new and different ways. And so um, they have been looking at high impact practices what we're doing at South Dakota State University, what works at South Dakota State University, and how can we do more of what works here at the university. They have been um, really digging into some of the numbers. I know our Wintrode Student Success Center has been looking at how do we continue to enhance the, um, the um, I'm going to get the, the name of it wrong, but our, our EAB platform our EAB platform Connect State, um, how can we use that in new and better ways to really reach out to those students and get them in and talk to them more about, you know, how can we keep you here and, and um, help you continue to succeed. Some of the scholarship optimization work that we've done has really been focused on how do we get students 
um, the scholarships they need? How do we help them leave the spring semester with a level of confidence in their financial aid and their financial aid packages as they, um, as they leave campus so that they're ready for the fall semester? So we're doing things around the scholarship process to really help them feel that confidence that yes, when I come back in the fall, I am gonna have scholarships and I am gonna have financial aid and this is what it's going to look like. So those are all different things that, that we are doing around, um, around that student success initiative. We're looking at our first year experience to see what are the learning outcomes? How are we achieving those learning outcomes? And the Student Success Committee has been doing a lot of really great work along that front. So those are a few of the things that we are focusing on and, and emphasizing, but there I'm sure are a lot more, and Dennis may have some things to add to that as well. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Michaela. And so just a couple of things. So just in fact, uh, just today, David, I, so we had the folks from EAB um, here. So Jody Owen and, and Mary Kay, who, who had, had to depart tonight, sitting in there again uh, on, on a strategy meeting, uh, basically about how we can better uh, continue to, to evolve and, and utilize Connect State and our, and our platforms. So we did see a little bit of a reduction in, in our in our year-over-year -year retention rate. Now, um, now that being said, again, there are a lot of strategies, new strategies that are being implemented. Um, uh, the president asked me um, where we're sitting on retention numbers, you know, so so we're all really anxious to try to get that. I, one thing that uh, we got this far without mentioning Banner, but now I'm going to mention it, Mike. Uh, so we're not going to get through the whole thing, but, but but right now as we convert, right, so, so it's a little bit difficult for us to get information, actually. So that is one challenge that we have right now. I wish it wasn't the challenge we had right right now, but it is what it is, and we're, and we're working through that. So, um, so it's a little bit difficult for us, but I'm also very optimistic about a couple of other things. Um, mobile application, very, you know, other things like that. So mobile platform associated with Banner. Now I'm going to throw the bouquet to Banner, right? So uh, so what we could potentially do that way and in interacting with students, sending um, subtle reminders, sometimes maybe even not so subtle reminders in that, in that regard that we also think can really be helpful as we look at a comprehensive plan at driving retention. Uh, the last thing, and I mentioned, um, I mentioned the comprehensive campaign maybe a couple of times already, again, the comprehensive campaign also, I, I want to do a little bit of a call out here, a people-centered campaign, part of the people-centered campaign elements, when you see that, if you take a look at that overarching case statement, you're going to see a nice little call out in regard to retention efforts. So we, talk, we call out scholarships, but also around retention. And we know those factors. We know it's, it's tutoring and supplemental instruction and those kinds of things. So you're going to see elements of that in there, but it's also about things that make, you know, that, that really become also impactful in regard to the way students um, are navigating our campus and whether they're, you know, in a, in a good state or not, if you will, right? So mental health and, and wellness and, and all of those things are also critical components. Uh, so the wellness center expansion, I think, was a key part of that, right? So now if we continue to do that, and again, through the comprehensive campaign, hopefully we can continue to add some additional resources. I think that's the kind of approach it's really going to take in order to optimally hit that 80% target. So just wanted to add that as well. Go ahead. So the question was about uh, international student international students retention and, and recruitment right now yeah so uh, a, a, a great question so um, um, right now um, and I'm sitting here looking at Greg here as well so so that's an area where we're trying again some new strategies um, so what we'd anticipate is our international student enrollment number this next year will be smaller uh, than than this than this past year now that being said we're going to graduate a larger class and basically we believe that what we're going to bring in is going to be smaller than than what we graduate that's really going to be the primary reason um, for, for this it, it Yeah, about 90%. Yeah, so uh, very effective strategies there. So you're going to, what you'll see play out this next year is probably a smaller overall enrollment number, but nevertheless, again, a lot of strategies. And again, the retention numbers have, 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 been, have been, you know, uh, solid as far as that goes. 
where, again, we're really working hard to implement some new strategies would be around student recruitment. Uh, in addition to Rusty Wink, who's been out recruiting, now we've engaged in new, in new strategies, so some, uh, some other agents to bring, um, uh, to bring uh, new students to our campus um, associated with, uh, with their efforts overseas. Uh, so trying to do that and also identify other partnerships. Um, uh, so I could mention that as another strategy. So Greg, uh, Mary Kay, and I have been on a variety of calls uh, here when we're looking with some some groups trying to open up new creative programs three plus one type programs and in fact um, uh, Dean Berdanier and Dean Wolf Hall will be joining us on a call here as we try to explore some additional opportunities that we believe may again open up some new doors for international students Does that help a bit thanks couple of things on that out, outreach and extension. Um, first, there's a, there's a new um, web portal for, portal for uh, was iGrow, now it's SDSU extension. Extension dot sdstate.edu. So um, a, a much uh, more friendly program than when we launched, what, six years ago? Um, how, what? Nine years ago? <laughs> it was just yesterday. <laughs> um, great work by the extension team to get a new portal. Uh, very, uh, very easy to use, and ver we're very excited about it. Reaching, um, you know, more people than there are in this state. Be reaching people all around the globe with with, un with unbiased scientific information. Right, Lindsay? Uh, sorry. Um, so really proud of that work, uh, and on the. On the other side, um, the aviation uh, faculty next week are flying, just like they did last year, flying planes out the Cheyenne River to take uh, uh, kids uh, from the middle school on, on plane rides around the Cheyenne River uh, Reservation. And they're taking their, their, uh, uh, their uh, simulator, flight simulator, driving it out. And if you've ever driven to Eagle Butte, it's a long drive, especially pulling a trailer, isn't it, Paul? And uh, to show, to, to engage gr a group of young people who, uh, who uh, and expand their world view in a, a very exciting way. And the cool thing is they, they didn't ask for any money or permission. they just doing this. So um, doing a great job. Um, but, but Matt Miller and others uh, from, from chemistry went down to Marty Indian School, spent the day doing crazy science. And the, kid, you know, the videos are just incredible watching these kids' faces. So uh, great outreach uh, into to some underserved populations. It really warms my heart, and I appreciate it. Again, Matt didn't ask permission. He just went out and did it because it's the right thing to do. And uh, it's so lots and lots and lots of other outreach uh, examples of just uh, the impact this state and uh, I think you'd be very proud of. And so I hope you follow um, the Monday morning message and, 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 and I hope you're motivated uh, in terms of um, above and beyond and I hope you'll nominate um, your, your peer or your, fa your fellow uh, faculty member or whoever. And uh, we have, we, we'd like to be able to, we should be doing that every day. Is, is, uh, celebrating all the great work that's done on this campus uh, in Above and Beyond. But that's just two, two really cool examples that you might not have known about, plus some outstanding work refreshing uh, the main extension portal to, to SDSU. So, Other questions? Oh, there's Becky. <laughs> Other questions? I can't outweigh you, so. <laughs> David, how's the new digs? I'm doing well. <laughs> <laughs> 57. 57. Very obvious question. So you just finished your third year. Yeah. Uh, what are your plans, a couple of exciting things you're looking forward to in the next couple of years? So um, Rob asked, uh, I just finished, uh, you know, last week would have been the uh, third anniversary of when I was uh, president of SDSU. Thanks. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I was asked last week uh, by a friend, I don't know, maybe it wasn't a friend, I don't know, um, <laughs> how it was going, and I said it was the, the most exciting time of my life. <laughs> 
And that's absolutely true. And it's also been the absolute most rewarding time in my life. I thought I thought teaching was teaching for me up until now had been the most rewarding thing I'd had ever done. But now uh, this is really incredible. It's uh, it's it's great to serve you. It's great to serve the state. It's great to have a, a voice uh, at the table for things that I I hope I represent you on about the important uh, missions, Joe, that you brought up and that others have brought up. Um, so it's it's been a it's been quite a three years, and I'm really glad to have Jane at my side uh, helping me out. Um, next three years, I I, uh, I think the American Indian Student Center and the Wakini Initiative um, it's it's grabbing um, it's grabbing the attention of all the policymakers uh, in the state and uh, in the nation too. Uh, this is um, nobody's ever done this before. Uh, they've done. Um, certainly there's American Indian student centers at other campuses, but no one has been this intentional about um, about what we're about this effort. And I think once we get that center opened up, it'll just uh, it'll it'll just help us all understand uh, history in a more more inclusive and accurate way. And I think we will go into the next century better prepared to deal with those challenges that have been haunting us here in South Dakota for a long time. So that's one of them. Um, very excited about uh, the brand awareness of SDSU. And a lot of it uh, is, uh, uh, so we have 500 student athletes that just uh, represent us so well um, in their, not only in their athletic performance, but in their, their academic performance and their behavior, th all three. Uh, just great young men and women. And uh, so very excited about uh, that improving the brand image of this university, Rob. Um, the, the, there have been two, I get a kick out of this one, two identical uh, market analysis of our brand versus other brands. And, and we have the highest brand recognition of versus University of Minnesota, UNL. In, 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 a, in this region, we have extremely high uh, brand recognition and, and much higher than USD. And, I, and it, for me, that's just a duh. I mean, of course we do, but um, that's mean, but that's how I feel. <laughs> um, so I think, Rob, you know, the vision is to be a premier land grant university. So, what, so own that. I encourage everybody to own that. And what does that look like for you in the next three years? What does it look like for me? So if you don't think we're premier, help get us there. If you, if you do view, view yourself as premier, I know Vikram d uh, views his, his department as premier, help Vikram stay there. That's, that's our goal. Um, so that's our challenge, Rob, is to be a premier land grant university. And that's, what I, that's my vision. Um, and, and have it not even debatable. And so when, when those mechanical engineering kids just, you know, just, you know, the, the bot shot, this is my favorite of the spring. So Mark, Mike Barber isn't here, but Mike and I were running mates for six or seven years raising money and for the SDSU Foundation. And we asked um, Land O'Lakes for a, uh, a large donation, and we were told we weren't a tier one university, so they wouldn't give us any money. That we, They only gave money to tier one universities like the University of Minnesota. So um, I think there's two others. So uh, last at the NCAA tournament, basketball tournament, right, Justin, they had the bot shot, which was a competition that Land O'Lakes sponsored for engineering students and to build a robot. And so it's, mo it's more than engineering. It's computer science and what else, Bruce? Um, so three or four departments. So uh, and, and it was made possible by uh, one day for state, Steve, ten thousand dollars. So we had a, we we entered we took ten thousand dollars to enter, and I'm going to get this wrong, Bruce, but this great team of kids built a robot to shoot a basketball into a hoop, and uh, we we competed against a whole bunch of other land grant universities, including the University of Minnesota, sponsored by Land O'Lakes. We won, and we got ten thousand dollars. So. <laughs> So, so that's my vision the, for the university. So great athletics, great academics, and uh, high, high brand recognition and lots of pride. Everybody wearing the yellow and blue, understanding what our core values are and uh, working for their success. So, yeah. Well, on that, thanks for the softball. And uh, <laughs> I, I want to echo... Um, Dennis's uh, comments. Thank you so much uh, for 
for a great year. It's a great nine months. It's, it did, time is flying by. Uh, lots of success. You know, having 2,200 scholarships awarded to incoming freshmen before Christmas. All, all scholarships awarded for young people coming back next fall, awarded by April 15th. We had a lot of great targets. Super accomplishment by our student athletes in athletics. Um, and then all the, the academic performances at professional meetings and societal meetings, it just I couldn't be prouder of you. So thanks for all you do for those great young kids. And um, I'll see you Saturday at graduation or, uh, oh, Ellen has got something. I, I'd like to follow up on something that you just commented on, uh, President Dunn. And you were talking about being a first class in a tier one university. And many people d may have seen today several times the Ness School of Management and Economics. What they may not realize is that we were the only land-grant university without a business school in the country. And so if you're striving to be a top-class university and to be among our peers in our land-grant mm -hmm. university, I think we also want to recognize that the hard work that was done by you and the provost and Dr. Helling in prioritizing mm -hmm. this um, above a lot of other well-deserving issues. But uh, that was um, m many decades of diplomacy and politics that went into doing that. But if we want to strive to be in that top and in the best, that's what it's taken is to be able to go up against some of those norms, mores, and politics to be able to make things happen. And I think we owe you uh, thanks for being oh. able to do that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly proud of Provost Hedge. He, as an interim provost, he got done, he got a, a, a degree in business economics that 130 some years, no provost had ever done. And, <laughs> and I, I just couldn't be prouder of him. It's great work, Dennis, so hope, thank you. All right, we gotta make this little mic go live. Okay, thanks. So I appreciate that, but, but as we all know, right, I mean, there's so many people that are so so involved in that, and I wish Mary Kay was here too, because what a tr what a trusted, amazing colleague she is to me. Um, I know you all know that, and I get uh, the great benefit of that. But anyway, so thank you, President. But uh, again, there's so many people's hands in that stuff. It's like so many things we do, right? Yep. It's 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 teamwork. Um, but it's been fun to see us get a little bit closer to our lofty goals. Yeah, when you get. Down a little bit, just think about Land O'Lakes and that robot. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? I don't, I can, I'll say as long as you want to, but I know people have other lives than this. Thank you so much for a great year. Have a great summer, and we'll see you, I'll see you all summer. But uh, look forward to working with you again on other great things. So talk to you soon. Yeah.